Friends, we'd like to open it up right now to all of you to ask Ed any questions you may have. If I can just ask you, especially for our live streaming, if you can come over to this mic and you guys can form a line here and ask Ed any question you want. Right, Ed? Any. <laughs> Wonderful. Size 13 shoe. <laughs> Hi, I'm EJ Marino. If you don't know, thank you. Uh, one, I want to say Catwoman's a cult classic in my house. Thank you for that, because loved it. Do you have any advice for an artist who doesn't want to embrace the full digital world and kind of wants to stay in analog? Uh, good luck. <laughs> but uh, uh, my heart goes out to you. Um, okay. It's very difficult to embrace an all analog digital world. When you think about just the process, you know, even if you shoot on film, you know, at some point, how are you going to edit? You're going to oh, <laughs> yeah. get your rewinds out, you know, and, and go through your sync block. Um, so there's that process. But then, you know, um, you can shoot a film. Uh, I mean, listen, we look at lots of films where we sit down with directors and they, and I immediately, which you got to understand, I never thought I'd be the one I, the, who says that, you know, we're going to shoot this digitally. I thought I'd always shoot it on film. And um, because I love film, I love the texture. I, I just still love the way it looks. It's still, you know, still got the grain and everything. You can emulate it, but it's not the same. But you can shoot it on film. Okay. But at a certain point, once you get in the post, you're going to have to start to do digital manipulation of it. And then everything that's on the distribution side, what they call deliverables, whether it's to the theater, whether it's to an airplane, you know, whether it's to foreign, it all becomes digital. And it's all a DCP. It's about that big right now, you know, that gets loaded into the theater. And most theaters have taken the conversion and they're projecting, uh, you know, digitally. Um, for me, this, this summer I was able to see the James Bond film in film. That was pretty cool, you know, because I had not seen that. And... Uh, as opposed to seeing all the other films. Usually I go see the films in IMAX 3D and geek out, but uh, oh, I just have to say that pick and choose your battles okay. would be my advice. But, uh, you know, still, if you want to shoot a film on film, go for it. Oh, thank you. Sure. Hi, my name's uh, Mackenzie Johnston, and um, I wanted to ask, you know, what work have you done that just when someone talks about you just feel so happy and prideful that they love your work? <laughs> you know? um, well, for me, uh, it's my passion. Uh, I guess the, uh, I, whenever someone said it couldn't be done, I'd say, oh, damn, why'd you say that? Because I always felt the challenge uh, in, in the era that I grew up, being an outlier and being at the right place at the right time with George and all that. We just had the, you know, we, we would just do whatever to make it work. You know, whether it was a rubber band or Vaseline or however. I mean, literally in the optical photography world, we went out and the guys on the stage, you know, they'd be out there grubbing it in motion control photography and we'd be an optical photographer. We had like doctor's coats on. We'd wear white coats. And we'd tell them it was kind of foreboding you can't come in here because we're like manipulating what you've been doing. <clears throat> but it's about the process to me. It's what I'm most proud of is that I enjoy whatever project it is, starting from the beginning and just going through the process. I mean, you start with the written word or you start with an idea sometimes. And the written word then becomes, you know, that script that you're, you're trying to then make into a film. And every step along the way, something changes. You know, because your final script is the film that the audience sees. So I enjoy the process, and that's, that's more been a statement about my career, from going from analog to digital to working with so many different artists and uh, setting up a lot of different companies. But if it's, I had to pick one project that would define me, it'd be Who Framed Roger Rabbit. So. <laughs> Thank you. Sure.
Actually, my name's Randall, and I actually have two questions. One, uh, what is the your favorite story that you've ever been a part of telling? And two, who, what director did you enjoy most working with? <laughs> it put me on the spot. <laughs> um, story. Um, Some of them are, n are not visual effects films, per se. Like, I made a film called Almost Famous. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a lot of fun making, uh, as far as rock and roll and talking about a kid who's a reporter in rock and roll. I thought that was a really good story. Um, as far as director, um, for a long, long time, my favorite director has been Bob Zemeckis, who did Who Framed Roger Rabbit and Back to the Future. And, uh, those those movies uh, um, recently did Flight. It was out, but Bob was this type of director who um, I have the same mindset with. You know, any challenge was possible. I mean, and when I say any challenge is possible, when when I was doing uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, uh, we were also doing the movie Willow and Empire of the Sun at the same time, and there was over two thousand shots that we we're all having to do. And um, George Lucas came to me, and, and Steven Spielberg said, came to me and they said, you're going to have to job some of this work out. And I said, well, not right now. I don't really want to let go of it. I think we can do it all. And uh, I'll let you know. Uh, and uh, I was so prideful of the team that we pushed the work out. And uh, like, it's like another story. Jeffrey Katzenberg once said to me, you know, on Roger Rabbit, if this film's not a success, then you'll never work in this industry. And I just said, and what if it is? But uh, I was a young kid then, and I was just, uh, I felt that, that we, we could get these done. But Robert Zemeckis, as a director, was the type of director who would take on any challenge. We built cameras. We built new VistaVision cameras to shoot Roger Rabbit. We'd never done this technique before. We'd never tried to create a two-and-a-half-dimensional 2D animation with keyframe animation. Um, it, it just has never been done for the schedule and all. I mean, it, 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 he just... He wants to try new things. I mean, he went on to the whole world of what he did as far as motion capture and trying to create that. And God bless him. And he had some challenges there. And I wouldn't say they were all successful, but at least he, he took on the challenge. So, yeah, it, it goes back to, to, to my heart and soul as far as a director that wants to undertake a challenge. Thank you very much. And thanks for coming. Sure. Hi, uh, I'm Chris Campbell. First off, I want to thank you very much for a lot of your movies. They helped inspire me to even come here. And uh, what would you say is uh, a sign that you know you're working on a, you know, a good story? What would you think? Sorry, what was the question again? Um, what signs are there that you're working on like a really good story? Like, for instance, oh uh, well, a good Jones story. First of all, if it's a re if it's a good read on a script. It's one of those things where you don't, it's a page turner and you don't put it down, that's a good sign, you know. If I can pop through a script, you know, it's 120 pages and I can pop through it in, you know, an hour and a half and I'm like, whoa, and then start it over again, I know I got something there. But it's not very often that you get scripts like that because the scripts you get, you might think that three quarters of them are fantastic or the script's fantastic, but you know that you're going to have to help develop the other parts of it. You're going to really have to look at the character arcs. You're going to have to look at the first act, the second act, the third act. You're going to have to make sure that it all comes together to be able to tell the story that the audiences will be engaged in and follow. But that is the blueprint. That, that script is the blueprint. Okay. And um, I'm a huge fan, so would you mind signing some of my movies of your... <laughs> sure. Afterwards, I'd be more than, more than happy to sign. Thanks yeah. a lot. Yes. <laughs> Hi, my name is Diego, and uh, my question is regarding about, like, you talk a lot about how you, the digital world is changing every time, how to stay on top of it. My question to you is, like, how do you stay on top of, like, a digital world that's constantly changing? Uh, it's not easy. Um, I, I, you have to immerse yourself in it, uh, understand the tools, which I think most of you are getting uh, that, that education for here at Full Cell. I, I mean, I understand what the curriculum is here. I've discussed it, and I think that it's a fantastic curriculum. So 
immerse yourself so that you understand the tools, especially the ones that you want to, to be specific to your craft, whatever your craft might be here in the school, uh, if it's other than filmmaking. Uh, and then keep an eye out as far as, you know, what you, you, you see as far as what's on the horizon. And because on the digital side, you know, there's, um, there's places like Seagraph uh, that you get to see new, new things that come up at Seagraph on an annual basis, which is uh, a computer graphics convention that happens around the United States in different cities. But there's, there's uh, tutorials, and there's always people in those tutorials um, that are talking about processes that are proprietary processes that are built for different films, um, and they're talking about what they are. And those usually are the places that those proprietary processes uh, you hear about, and then they become maybe a standard in a piece of software that you can use and manipulate later on. It used to be that there was lots of software manufacturers back when when I started this, and now it's it's kind of they've consolidated. Um, so, with every studio that you might go to or work at, yes, there is the 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 suite of software that that's loaded on your computer, so you can load on your computers from Maya and to to whatever you might be rendering in to Nuke, whatever it might be. But then there's the glue. And there's the glue that's the, the, the other pieces of software that's written by that studio for their pipeline that make it special. And it's part of those things that I would look at as far as how they're writing that glue. Digital technology, as far as camera origination, you just, that's like a, it leapfrogs each other every year. You know, so you have Sony or you have Arri, and one goes over the other. And then that usually gets feedback from the director of photography. So it's just, it's about staying online and staying in tune about what, what's going on as far as each specific part of what's happening. I mean, the same thing as you can go to a, a script um, software and you can use the software now so you can annotate on someone else's script and pass it back and forth, all those types of things. There's every part of the process, there's tools that are, that are being invented and being made all the time. So there's no easy answer for you except diligence. You know, and staying on top of it and maintaining your passion and realizing that whatever tool you want to use, just find out more about it and see what else is out there. Okay, thank you. Sure. Mr. Jones. Joey Morelli. Joey Morelli. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Hall of Fame inducted. Thank you. That was, uh, this is the one seminar I was looking forward to coming to. Um, the reason I came to Full Sail was to learn compositing. Uh, it's my goal. Uh, if you remember in my speech, uh, at the end when I said, uh, I'm not done, I'm not anywhere near done, uh, it's because I want to get to the level of compositing. This is all what has inspired me throughout my career for 15 years. What would you say to somebody who wants to take that compositing track to get to that level? Wow. Well, uh, um once again, you're, you're a man of my heart because I, I come from the compositing world, obviously, as far as where I started. And, and uh, it's always about having that eye and the aesthetics as far as what, what feels real and combining, whether it's two images or whether it's 150 images, you know. Uh, it, it's that sensitivity. Um, and moving forward, I would consider, you know, and, and recommend to you, which already you've done, that's to take bigger challenges and to, 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 to stretch yourself out even more than what you've already done and, 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 and try to create uh, or be in those environments um, where people are challenging you. And as they spoke about you in the, in the introduction, of, you know, that, that it's tough to be around you because you're a perfectionist. <laughs> I think what I'd say to you is that you want to have other people that are of the same vein of you that are pushing you because they're a perfectionist and telling you this needs to be a little bit better. Right. So it's finding that right environment, that right home that, that serves your purpose as far as what you want to do. Uh, I just Compositing today is so layered you know, when it comes to films and visual effects. You know, it's just so much you can layer on top of it. And it's it's understanding how to create those flow graphs and and how to manipulate it and bring one out one element out more than the other. Mm -hmm. So um, it's just about finding that right place. Let's, you know, it's continue to test yourself. 
got you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you for you. being here. Yeah. Appreciate Thank it. You. Um, I was just wondering, like, as visual artists, sometimes we're looking for inspiration, and I was wondering what fuels you as an artist. What inspires you, like light or? Well, music? light, light in nature has inspired me always, and just you know, it's uh, like um, just staring off. You know, it's you know, I guess I, I lost lots of girlfriends too, as far as walking in the woods. You know, um, <laughs> but um, it's always been studying you know, light and how it works as far as the environment or how it works on a character, how it wraps around a subject. Uh, I can remember on Who Framed Roger Rabbit, you know, it used to be, we used to just put uh, shadows as black. And then I did this whole study where I was like looking at shadows and they were actually had blue values in them and things like that, or they absorbed the value of wherever it was. And so then I created this whole technique where I actually painted on film with film uh, to create different colors within a scene, and then I composited those together. So I'm always aware of light and what's happening in the environment around me. Um, it, it's, it's observation is the biggest thing. Um, but I also think that it's also, there's, besides that, it's also understanding composition and an artist and understanding what, how, you, how you compose, what, what engages the eye. There's some theories like when you cut on a film, whether you cut from a wide shot to a close-up, that you keep everything in the center of the frame so that your eyes don't move. So if the action's in a wide shot and the, the dialogue and all, and then you cut to a close-up, you want to make sure that that cut is so much that you're looking at right there. So as you look at that, that's part of your composition. We just... Uh, just finished a film that came out in the theaters at Christmas. It was uh, Cirque du Soleil 3D, and I did it with James Cameron, uh, which was a whole other story. But uh, James Cameron, second day we were filming Las Vegas of the Cirque shows, he said to me, so what do you think, you know, for your 3D pipeline? And I said, are you kidding me? Why are you asking me? You're the master. You know, but he really wanted to know what I thought about putting it together. But what he did, in, in the case of offering up 3D and looking at environments and studying stuff, he basically said to create more dimension, you need to create, uh, you just can't be black in the background. So you need to have smoke, you need to have something on the Z-axis that you can look at. So it was, it, it's about those types of things where it's the subtle thing that if you, uh, uh, it's the acuity of atmosphere that if you really look at in, in an image, that you really need to look at the details that sometimes everyone overlooks. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, so um, as a person who's not here to study for film, what books or uh, any kind of websites that you would recommend to maybe further our knowledge in, in that kind of aspect? Uh, filmmaking 101. <laughs> uh, listen, uh, um, I mean, you can just go online, and there's plenty of books online as far as filmmaking. And, uh, you know, so if you want to be a filmmaker and you're looking at as far as the art of the story, you know, you can find books online that tell you that. If you're going to be a director or working with actors, I would tell you that actors recommend that you understand how to work with actors. Um, another little story. But on Cats and Dogs, I work with a first-time director. Uh, I won't mention his name like Lawrence Guterman, but um, <laughs> he, we were doing a movie in Cats and Dogs, and, and we had animal trainers, and so, you know, animals only do certain things. You teach them their head to go left or right or whatever. In the middle of it, he's telling the animal trainer, well, get him to blink and, you know, go like that, and the animal trainer said, Larry, we can't do that. He either goes left or right. Then what happened after that is he started directing the actors the same way. <laughs> So, and the actors were like, are you crazy? You know, just let us do the scene. So what happened was one of the actress, the, the primary actress, she gave the director a book on how to talk to actors. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, that's very important also is to understand your subjects and how you're going to deal with them. Uh, you know, but it goes back to, uh, you know, script, get the right story, make sure that story is one that you want to tell. 
you know, and it, you put your heart into it. And then if you have performances, whether they're synthetic or they're real, understand how to get those performances out so they have emotion. And then go about the filmmaking process. And surround yourself with good crew. Don't be, a, uh, don't be you know, scared not to have people that know more than you. If you have a great idea, they're going to help you bring it to the screen. Thanks a lot, man. I appreciate it. Uh, hi, my name is Benny Moss. Um, I have to admit, I'm a little bit starstruck. I came in here and didn't know anything you had worked on. And once he started naming things and seeing all your work, it's, it's very inspiring. So thank you for being here. Um, my question is, I've always been fascinated with uh, um, miniatures, like, you know, with Star Wars and Lord of the Rings. Um, to me, they've always looked so much better than, like, when you have a, com a completely computer-generated, you know, scenery shot with maybe buildings or something like that. And I'm curious as to uh, if those still have a future um, in film, you know, because I know digital uh, image is becoming better and better every day. But for me, like, real explosions or, um, you know, miniatures right. look so much better to me. Well, they, they do have a future. But um, once again, it's about choosing the right tool for the right job. So like the last James Bond movie that just came out this summer, there was a lot of miniatures, oversized miniatures used in that, you know, and, and they used them very wisely in how they, they went about it. There's a lot of digital work, but they used miniatures in that. Um, but more and more, what happens is, is that filmmakers want complex camera moves sometimes, and, and it becomes very arduous to figure out how to do that with a miniature because you, you, you have, you know, so much movement that you can do within that actual miniature you built. I will agree with you that texture-wise and how you build it, it's, it's, it's much more malleable and, 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 and looks, looks good, and, but at the same time, CG environments are coming about these days that you can create a lot of stuff that looks pretty damn good, especially if you layer it in with atmospherics. But just pick and choose wisely in the case of miniatures. Uh, for example, um, we have uh, a project that we're trying to get off the ground. It's with Julie Andrews, the, the famous legendary actress. And she wrote a book, and, and it's called The Great Amer American Mousicles. And it's about, she actually, there was a mice in one of her dressing rooms in a set of Broadway, and she didn't want to kill it. She just wanted to remove. So she wrote this kid's book about that the mice actually live underneath the stage and do their own performances. And so we're trying to figure out how to do this film or, or series of kind of directed DVDs with her to, to inspire families and kids and keep Broadway alive. And what we've come up with is to build miniatures of the set, of the little mouse set underneath the stage of Broadway so that then CG min, uh, mice can perform those miniatures. And the miniatures that would be found objects, you know, like if there was a staircase, it might be candles from a birthday cake that, that formed the, the, the railings and all and that type of thing. Um, so it's, it's a use of something creative for us that's a tool that we think we can do and we can, we can then use a lipstick camera and, and shoot all around where we want and do our previs and set it up that way and then do the animation to that. So that's an, an example um, that we might be able to use a miniature. Also, um, do you... Th I wanted, I'm curious if you know about the cost effectiveness. That's why I'm curious of why so many people choose to do just, you know, a digital image. Is that because it's cheaper than building a miniature and shooting it? I mean... I wouldn't say it's cheaper okay. <laughs> for quality. I mean, uh, it seems like shooting a real explosion uh, with three different cameras at different speeds from different angles and, you know, you have two, two miniatures of the same thing that once you shoot those and you blow it up, that's yeah. it. <laughs> and uh, you, you have to make a choice as a filmmaker which one you're going to use. That's what's happening when Abbott and everything came on as far as editorial. Everyone said it's going to become faster and cheaper. Actually, it's not so much faster or cheaper. It's just that you now have more choices. Okay. You know, so that, that's the type of thing back into the, uh, the, the, the history of filmmaking is that you, you, you figure out what the right choice is. I, I once worked uh, with this gentleman, Linwood Dunn, who goes all the way back to making uh, the, the Orson Welles movies and all this stuff, and he was in his 90s. And, um, I mean, he's, he's just brilliant. He did Citizen Kane. And he said to me, you guys, I don't know what you're doing. 
When I built an old Derrick for Citizen Kane, I just went down to the model shop, bought one for 10 bucks, and shot it, you know? <laughs> so it's really, it's, it's picking the right tool for the right job, but uh, it's not so much the digital's less expensive. So, okay, more power to you. Hello, my name is Lorena Abreu, and um, as a quick precursor to my question, you had worked on, you had made several films by the time you finished film school, right? right. So you had real world experience independent of your studies? Well, it was in conjunction with my studies, but I, I mean, oh, okay. I, I made 14 films in school, but they were all oh, okay. documentaries or dramatic films. So that I, I just happened to be at a school where um, I went in and I ran the camera department, so I could get the cameras anytime I wanted. Um, and my buddies and I, basically there was three of us, and uh, one was sound and the other two uh, of us were, were images. And we would just go, and we'd pick a subject, write a script, and we'd go make a film. And uh, they were, we learned a lot. We learned everything you know, that you should learn you know, from making films. Okay, so my question was, what advice would you have for a student who's pursuing work in the industry simultaneously while they're in school? For, like, for how would you prioritize between studies and work in the industry? Where would you place your emphasis? Well, do you think? Um, <laughs> I I don't. Uh, I'm a true believer that, and especially here at Full Sail, as far as what they have to offer, gives you a good overview of everything that there is, and so you need to really concentrate on that. But if you're going to work and study together, then I would recommend you get an entry-level job, be a PA, get on the set, get, get behind the scenes, you know, so that you understand uh, the mechanics of how a film actually works, you know, and, and you see it, and you see professionals working. You know, it's, my, son's, my son's 18, and he wants to be a, a, a gamer. Uh, and uh, I said, well, maybe. Yeah, I said, but I'm going to send you to a friend of mine who's a first AD, and you're going to work for him for a movie as a PA, which I just know what that means, which he's going to be working 12, 16 hours a day. But what he's going to do, it's going to open up his eyes to how a film and, and the actual the, the, the construction of a film is done and shot and what happens on it. I mean, a grip is just as important as the DP. I mean, I, I, you know, a good grip, a good gaffer, a good key light guy is you got to have. So I just say, find an open door, put your foot in there, and don't let them close it until you get in. Okay. Thank you so much. Sure. Hey, my name is Kick Saints Theodorio. My friends call me Bob. How are you doing? <laughs> and uh, my question is, uh, what do you think technology is going to take cinema? Do you think it's going to keep making it better indefinitely, or do you think there's gonna be a point where we just have to stop and say, okay, it's getting, too, it's getting too crazy, we have to go back to the basics? Well, I used to believe that there might be a, a, a stop sign someplace, and uh, I don't believe it anymore. I just believe that technology is becoming better, faster, more intuitive in what you're able to do. It, it, so for me, it's one of the greatest things about technology, it's not only the tools for creation, but it's also the tools for distribution, you know? Now it's not just you put it in the theater, you can put it anywhere, you know. All of you could have your own YouTube channel if you don't already. Uh, so it's about that, that type of distribution and the ability to, to show stuff uh, is only going to continue to be enhanced. You know, that's the way the world is. There's nothing that, that is private or you can keep a secret. You can distribute whatever story or whatever piece of art that you want. Uh, as far as tools, uh, I, you know, listen, cameras are getting better and better as far as, you know, just the glass that goes into cameras and the, the usefulness of them and what they can do. Uh, editing systems are better. All digital tools as far as visual effects are better. I mean, uh, you, know, it's, uh, you know, things like Houdini and, and particle simulations. I mean, it's just, it's just mind-blowing in what you can do with that stuff. So I, I, everyone, because, because we're... We're a world that lives together, and we're a world that wants to push the envelope. Everyone's going to have an idea, and some people have really great ideas that are continuing to push technology. So we're going to be able to use those 
as, you know, as filmmakers. So I don't see it stopping, believe me. Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a hell of a roller coaster. All right, and another thing is uh, with the new technologies that keep coming out, do you think uh, it makes us better filmmakers or does it just make us lazier? Um, I, it doesn't make you a better filmmaker, that's for sure, because you just don't press a button and make a film. Right. You know, it's what I was wanting to get across today as far as it's the story that counts. We're storytellers. Figure out how to tell that story that's engaging, that's immersive, that, that's full of emotion. You know, whether you're laughing or whether you're crying, that's what makes a good piece. That's what makes a good film. Um, you know, the, the camera, the editorial systems, you just don't push a button. It's, you know, it's not simpler. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, my name's Jasmine Springfield. Um, my question was, um, you said that we should always look for work and kind of make ourselves, put, our, put ourselves out there and not really, I don't want to say turn down a job, but you know, to apply for basically everything. So is it, does it work to your disadvantage for being somewhat particular? Like if you have a certain genre or a certain company that you know that you want to work for? No, uh, that, not so whatsoever. I mean, if that's what, where you want to go, uh, you know, then just be, you know, uh, just knock the door down. You know, <laughs> just realize they might say no once or twice or three times. It's like the, the, uh, the Hall of Fame inductee, Marcella, she knew where she wanted to go as far as Miami. That, you, you want to you go there. You want to be there. You know, so you, you just have to be persistent if that's what you want to do as far as a particular company or genre or, or, what, or whatever it might be as far as uh, filmmaking. So when doing that, you, there's no such thing as, like, I'll take anything just to work for that company? Well, you don't, you don't really want to say I'll take anything, but you really want to say I'll take anything. You know, like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> So, like, if you want to work for Disney and they hire you to be a character in the park, is that considered a start or are you just doing it for nothing? What, what is your ultimate goal? Well, I want to direct uh, and produce children's films and television shows. So if you're a character in the park, do you think that you're, you're starting to understand how children are reacting to that character that might help you as directing children's films later on? Yeah, absolutely. So then that answers your question, right? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> What a wonderful afternoon. Very exciting. I, I told you you wouldn't be disappointed. Thank you so much, Ed, for coming to the university. We've learned uh, so much from you and taking the time to visit us. Let's hear it for Mr. Ed Jones. Thank you very much to all of you. Thanks for being here. Uh, I hope that there's a little bit of wisdom that I was able to impart on you today. Um, once again, it's, it's about passion. It's about uh, following your dream. And um, don't ever give up, no matter how many times you're told no, because you will be. <laughs> God bless. <laughs>